You're listening to Unbridled with your host, Genevieve and Carly. Welcome to Unbridled. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm your host, Genevieve. And I'm Carly. And this is Unbridled. And today we have the wonderful Michelle from Canada on the call here. And we're so excited to be interviewing you and just get some feedback. I don't even know, honestly, a lot of your history and how you got into the sport or how you became so dedicated. So I'm excited to kick this off. And yeah, if I knew half of it myself, I wouldn't have had been racking my brains reading the list of questions saying, yeah, how did that happen anyway? (laughs) We are. This is great. So how long have horses been a part of your life? Um. Well, literally or figuratively, I was one of those kids who, you know, took a piece of binder twine and made their sister go in front of them with the binder twine around their waist. And then we would canter around the front lawn. (laughs) I lived in a city. I was born and raised in a city. Oh, wow. But it happened to have a riding stable across a major road and in the park system. So away I tottered at about 10 years old for my first set of riding lessons. And that was the um, the classic nose to tail, all 10 of you around a too small uh, arena. And bear in mind, we have winter up here, so that formed part of the experience. But that was so uh, as a 10 year old, that's kind of where I started and um, we went from there. Up in our area here, a lot of people have cottages. And instead of having a cottage, uh, my sisters and I begged my parents could we have a farm instead? So lucky us, we did get a farm and it was a weekend and summertime retreat and happened to have a river running through it, which meant that like back in those days, you didn't hesitate to keep horses on it all the time, even though you were only there on weekends. So uh, horses in, in the family since about when I was about 13, I guess. That's crazy. No, that's so exciting that you were able to get a farm. I was the same way. I begged my parents for a farm for years and years and years, but I wasn't, I was like 13, I think when we finally got it before then I was just begging, bartering, stealing to get on ponies. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. Well, our, my first pony and bless his little heart. I, I was turning 14 at that time. So I was like already too big for him. But he was a fiery little thing. His name was Fury and we got him at a local auction. And that was the first introduction to riding outside of lessons that those became the years of like just figuring it out um, ourselves as as three sisters and uh, I don't know how the outcome really was but um, I kind of got more serious about wanting to know what I was doing with a horse in my early 20s okay and uh, I was a teacher at the time and so could fit into my schedule some riding lessons um, with a reputable coach uh, in a reputable facility. Uh, so it really made it uh, nothing to do with games. It was all eventing based. Mm. Uh, so I felt that I, I learned much more about how to ride, how to ride effectively. And that has stuck with me through all the years. I've you know dipped back into lessons again in my 40s, I guess. And uh, I tried to learn and continue to to grow as a rider, even though I start to have more limitations, I'm trying to to make it the best that uh, that I, it can be for me and the pony. That's that's so exciting. So, how did you get exposed to mounted games? Okay, so I have three kids, and at the time they were old enough to join pony club. Up here, it's called Prince Philip Games. So I was the uh, the parent to you know you had to help out, you had to. You had to buy first one pony for one kid, and then you had to buy another one. And and they had uh, also done a fair bit of riding with an event base. So it came as no surprise after about, I want to say, five years of, of that, where they did all the disciplines, that it became the declaration in the family by my eldest. She said, I'm focusing on games. That's, that's all I'm doing now. <laughs> okay, so we all trotted in line behind her and uh and i'll admit as a parent it did make things easier um because at the time my two boys were growing like weeds and i was thinking how i I kind of sat ringside and and did the adding well that one needs a new horse that one needs a new horse this one needs a new everything 
So it became monstrously expensive in my mind. And the, the change to games was just easier all around. Yeah. We had outgrown or, you know, event horses that quickly became uh, games ponies. And uh, it kind of went from there. My own first try at games came as a result of um, uh, being involved with the pony club and do try to do my part coaching uh, of the little guys, the the sea riders. So for us, that's like five, six, seven year olds. And uh, one of the older parents said, "Hey, there's a bunch of adults are going to ride." doing some games at a, it was a major exhibition in Toronto, and this would have been the year 2000. And so at that point, I wasn't quite 40, but that's where I started games was at this competition. And the best part of that is there is video taken by the wife of one of the riders. And there were, it was an indoor arena, prestigious facility, only three or four teams could fit. But the woman recording, when you look at the video, the video does this <laughs> she, the whole time. And it's not because she was unsteady or anything like that. She wasn't under, under the influence. It was because she was laughing at our efforts so hard <laughs> that she could keep the camera still. So we still talk to this day about, yeah, that video with Maisie just shaking the camera, laughing at us trying to pick up litter and trying to turnaround bins. So oh my God. Um, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> that was the beginning. I don't know, kind of, it took a little while to get kickstarted after that, but I, I think I was pretty hooked from the outset because it seemed like a challenge. If I couldn't pick up litter, there was absolutely something wrong with me that was fixable. <laughs> it's true though. I mean, it is something that you can practice. And for the most part, every skill set in mounted games with sans mm -hmm. vaulting, because I even struggle with vaulting, let's say, but for the most part, everything you can do if you just put enough time into it. Yeah. Uh, and I think um, looking at it as a, as a whole body thing rather than just, uh, yeah, I lean down and I do this, you kind of start thinking more strategically about your own fitness level. Yeah. You think about your, your horse's fitness level. Um, it's kind of a nice, um, I think it's a nice way to age, if you will. You have a passion for a particular sport and that keeps you healthy and fit and motivated. Um, at least that's how it's been for me. So I, I have enjoyed it. I am the the only one other than my granddaughter who still rides in the family. So really? I inherited multiple bits and pieces and multiple everything you would need to, to do games. So there I am. I carry on. Now, who was your first games pony? Yours, like dedicated? My very own games pony when I was 40. Okay. So there was this pony named Mikey. And Mikey toted around my nine-year-old boy at that time for, oh, he did everything. Mikey was a little hackney cross, oh, short God. back, very strong. And Mikey bucked me off every competition we went to at least once per session. Oh, wow. When I, I know now I wouldn't tolerate it at all, but at the time it just seemed a matter of course. And the, the, the team was out there for fun and we were all learning and we, and we held practices once a week. That was another thing that was a really kind of neat way of um, approaching the sport was developing this, this kind of a social group. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of what I really enjoy about the over 25 division in which I ride now. And the group at home here in Canada, where um, we don't have that particular division, but uh, we have a good family feel to the whole mm -hmm. um, scenario. But anyway, so the first pony was named Mikey. He he babysat my son beautifully up and down the field, but he did not like that I was presuming to ask him to do anything out there. So after that, I, I wound up, you know, borrowing a pony and, and he was a larger pony and I, I enjoyed that and uh, folks weren't interested in selling. So I went, went out and found uh, a pony who uh, was the first, I think my first games pony where I had to do the, the training to games, uh, wasn't a young pony. Um, and he was 14, three came out of Alberta as a starving uh, pony. There was a drought that year, but um, 
he became really adept at, at what he was doing and lived to a very ripe old age and, and many, many people enjoyed him. So I've, I've had the good fortune of finding the odd star along the way that, uh, yeah. that has had some really good longevity in the sport. Um, yeah. And how old is Tallulah? She is, uh, by veterinary verification, she's 20. You know, you do the, uh, okay, well, let's see, when did I get her? I don't know. Well, <laughs> she came to me, but quite by fluke. I was a principal in a school. I had a teacher who had a little gal she was coaching for the hunter jumper ring. And this little gal had this pony named Lula, and uh, she was going to be moving on to something a little bit more cooperative for hunter jumper and also probably another six hands high, like beyond Lula's height. Mm -hmm. So um, I just said, oh, well, I don't know when they're ready to give it away. Let me know. So the next day <laughs> I was told they're ready to give it away. Next Nobody, day. no kid tried it. So at that time, Tulu was a five or six year old. Wow. I went to try her and she could like canter on the spot and she could just hold. She was just one of those, okie dokie. Well, I don't know. I can see why no kids can ride her, but she jumped everything in sight. And eventually I, I got the little gal. She's a very uh, brave rider. I said, uh, so uh, I see, you know, you're riding her in this snaffle bit. Uh, what do you usually ride her in? Because I could see this is looking just under the, the limit for control. <laughs> well, it was Pelham that she usually rode her in. <laughs> anyway, so that's how Tallulah came to me. Uh, she was a, a spare pony for quite a long time. Uh, and wow. I don't even know why she shifted to be the main one, but she did. And uh, yeah, she's been going strong ever since. It's crazy. 15 years with her. Uh -huh. yeah. That is so exciting to the partnership that you can form when you have a pony for that many years. Yeah. And when I think in terms of people uh, starting up and, and in particular in over 25, where sometimes people are coming at it a little later in life, they, they don't always have the opportunity to develop uh, with a, a skilled games pony, mm -hmm. that kind of rapport and trust. So that's where I feel fortunate. And I also try to really reflect on that as I've had the good fortune of working with and playing with a number of teams or this, you know, in the case of MGAA, kind of the same team, but many different members of the team over time. Yeah. And I, th I think it's really important when you are looking at team play to recognize that every pony has its limitations, its ages and stages of being able to contribute to the team. And it doesn't stay the same year to year. So I think that's one of the really nice challenges about um, being a team member is to really start using your ponies and your riders strategically yeah. and recognizing the changes that occur year to year. No, that's so Carly, true. I had the, the good fortune of riding with Carly and her green pony <laughs> was a bit of a squirrel. And uh, we wherever we could, we used Remy strategically. Don't don't ask him to do things that are, are not part of his repertoire right now. Right. Take advantage of what you have yeah. and uh, try and build. So Right. And you never know how after a season, like, you know, you go into winter and you give them the winter off and they come back. I find my pony always comes back so different, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing with Hero. Definitely when I'd bring him back in the spring and be like, okay, you had your 60, 90 days off. Yeah. And now we come back in and I feel like it kind of ruminates and there's some things that come back and they're more mature and you're like, oh, that's like five steps up. And then there's other things where you're like, how did we regress to here? Yeah, <laughs> like you're reevaluating. You know, yeah. Isn't that it? Um, Tallulah gets from her last competition until her about two months ahead of her first competition in the spring. She gets that time off. I have others that I'm, you know, working with. So I have always felt that she's benefited from getting uh, that that pure rest, just yeah. be a horse. And she's always come back with, as you describe, like new things she's either um, she's she's really assimilated into into her way of being, and other things have kind of dropped. There were yeah. quite recently she she's taught herself, and I haven't really appreciated it or found the solution. She has taught herself that when rounding a bucket for quoits, or for Windsor Castle, one should stop and stand quite upright 
out the bucket and refused to move on in any way that would allow a rider to nicely scoop out. So this has been <laughs> self-taught. She taught herself over the last couple of months. And as I say, it's certainly um, changed the flavor of uh, my play, both at home and away. But uh, and when I start scanning the race list for Windsor Castle, whew, okay, whew, it's not there. Great, We're, we got away with this again. I got to fix this problem. But there you go. You know, it's it's um, trusting the pony, knowing that when you know, given time off, they benefit, they enjoy it, they enjoy doing a range of of other activities beyond beyond the games field right. uh, to keep their full body fitness and their mental health in a, in a good place. Do you have a pony right now where you are training to do games with possible retiring of Tallulah? What's that look like? I have, uh, actually, there are three ponies here. Now, the one it, it, I purchased because he seemed like an old gentleman and it was during COVID and he wasn't in a super good situation. So I brought him along and, but he's about the same age as Tallulah. He's, so I, I don't really see him as the follow-up, but I do have two others. One that I have ridden games for three years, but I would have to say that he's not particularly interested in games mm-hmm. in that as time has gone on, he's shown himself to be more inclined to perhaps trot up the field and, and probably canter or hand gallop mm-hmm. back. But um, that's become his way of being. Mm-hmm. I have a younger one than that. He's six now, and I've had him since he was two, three. I have a half Arab uh, filly. She just turned four, but she's very handy. She's very light. She's uh, maybe a bit long-legged for what I would say is a classic get down in the dirt games pony, mm-hmm. but she is certainly uh, willing and she'll have speed. And we'll just see how it goes. Tallulah doesn't show every year. I say to myself, oh, this is it. This is it. Be prepared. We're done. Um, but then she just keeps showing an interest in, you know, pinning her ears and running fast and <laughs> stopping exactly where she thinks she needs to. And uh, yeah, it makes it a lot of fun. And he's the same with DJ. And he's like 23. And every year yeah. we're like, uh, oh. But then he shows up and he's like, hey, I got my winner off. Let's go. And he's so competitive yeah. naturally that he loves the challenge and he likes the structure of being in work. Well, you would probably, you're too young to remember in the sort of the olden days of my youth, you you really didn't even contemplate keeping a pony that was beyond 10 years old, a horse. So in that case, I wasn't doing games, but 10 years old, it was like double digits. Get Move that thing on. Um, now the 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 recognition of the the talent and depth of knowledge that these older ladies and gents um, of the equine world bring to sport. It's amazing. Yeah. And you, you stop looking so much at the age as, wow, what are they, are they having fun? And Mm -hmm. uh, you know, at at some point that's really what it's about. If the pony is having fun, that just makes it for the rider. No, I absolutely agree. You know, it's so funny actually. (laughs) I had boosted one of the posts on our unbridled page, one of our first podcasts that we had done, right? And there were so many angry reactions I got as a result of people thinking that ponies or horses couldn't enjoy being in work, the structure of being in work, like animal cruelty abuse type thing. Yes, yes. It makes like, (laughs) I know it's a radical perspective, but. It makes yeah. me think, right, about how much when you actually have like that personal relationship with your horse, yeah. you realize that they really thrive on trying to solve the puzzles or the questions that you're giving them and, and doing better and better and better. Like they just enjoy it. Yeah. I I had um, a re- I went, well, the, the first one that I would say was a really competent, this one that came as a starved horse out of Alberta. He was supposed to be 14 at the sales bar but i would reckon after i thought about it and you know really made myself accept the reality that he was probably closer to 20. oh wow and he went on for years and years and at the end like he would he knew all the games some of his favorites you just let the rain and it, and it became a joke hey here you want to see this cool get on and and point rye his name is rye alberta premium and point him point him at the lane where high low is set up just let go of the rain see what happens and he would just play the game and he loved it That's it was so great. cool yeah 
Yeah. It's just like anyone who's been on that pony and postman's chase where you go down and you like, mm -hmm. you, you know, have to get the stuff in the bag. And there, everyone's yeah. always had that story where they just couldn't get it organized. And there's that one pony that just weaves you home and you're like, <laughs> you let go of the reins and they take care of you. <laughs> There it is. Uh, yeah. So they, you know, it's that um, feeding the, the back and forth um, interplay of the horse providing confidence uh, for the rider and the rider providing confidence for the horse. And it, it, it really, it takes a long time. You know, when you, when I think back, that's 2000 was 23 years ago. And I, I don't even think of my, my work at learning and improving is even half done. I, yeah. I realized in my later, I want to say my later 50s that, hey, you know what? You're better at such and such race than you were. Or at least you practiced better at home than you ever did any other time in your history. Whether it showed up on the games field on competition day or not remains to be seen. But it was that sense of, hey, these 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 things can be continued to be learned. And that's what makes yeah. for me over 25, such a nice division for people who are, um, well, it's an age, it's the only age based division I know. So you're an automatic member um, as soon as you hit 25. So you, yeah. you can bring whatever your limitations are and your, your strengths and uh, really kind of um, find your space. No, absolutely. And there's such a wide age bracket, even for the O25 division. I mean, you have yeah. people who are just turning 25 all the way up to these crazy yeah. athletic ladies that have multiple generations behind them. And it's so exciting to see. I mean, and you're right because it keeps you, you're continually gauging your athleticism and making, all right, how, how mobile are my hips? Can I get up on the horse? How well can I yeah. lean? Yeah. You know, yeah. you're consistently looking at your composition and how well you're staying in shape just so that you can continue bettering your skill set. And yeah, a lot yeah. of people, I think we get to a point where you mature and then you sort of like back off on that, but this is like, you're right. Yeah. There's so much opportunity to get better. Yeah. I think it's the, you know, you, you, when you're honest with yourself and, and that to me is an attribute of perhaps more maturity where you can say, these are my limitations and you can choose to respect them or you can choose to just bowl through whatever. Um, but when you, you know, you look at the, the people with whom you have the opportunity to ride and you, then you start incorporating their limitations and their strengths. It really is a way of, well, I, I just view it as very uh, humbling and uh, enriching for yeah. me to say, okay, wow, uh, so and so on the team had, I one of my team members. I think my most recent comment was, "You used to be a two bounce person to get back on. You this year, you are a one bounce person." <laughs> and, and that was that to me is a huge reflection of their earnest work at yeah. improving their physicality. Um, and yeah, there's no, no looking back and saying, oh yeah, sorry, met, finished, met my limit. I think the O25 <laughs> division allows some latitude for those limits, let's say. Yeah. Um, and that, uh, when I compare it to up here, we have, um, we have mounted games competitions and it's called Equine Mounted Games Canada. Um, our focus because of our numbers being lower our focus has been in the last number of years at um, developing really good competitions with pairs, mm -hmm. individuals, um, okay. individuals, typically a couple times in a season. So the, as our example, this past year we had, so 2023, we had uh, six pairs competitions and we ran two kind of what we called fun days. So the scores didn't count, but our pairs championship is based on, the best five scores out of your six competitions. And each rider is assessed a score for each competition. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to stay with the same pair, That's nice. which is really kind of nice. It recognizes that in this day and age, people's ability to commit to one person is, is much more limited than it, than it was even five years ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. We also have run um, some individual competitions, which are, essentially the the two of them comprise the championship so we don't make it easy we don't have one 
nationals. We have to do a whole mess of competing. Um, and I think that's really been uh, good at driving people to maintain their practicing and maintain yep. their emphasis on it. Um, and on two occasions this season, uh, we held uh, on the Saturday of a weekend, we had pairs competition. And on the Sunday, we had individuals. So on the pairs day, you were running uh, eight races and then a 10 race final. Then the next day as an individual, you were riding eight races and a 10 race final. So if there is, if that isn't a test of horsemanship and your fitness level and your pony's guts, pure guts and heart, that, uh, yeah, it, it was really, um, I, I, as a competitor, I found it really invigorating. And I had the benefit of, you know, taking a day off afterward. <laughs> Right. But yeah, so that's, there's a different style between the MGAA competitions, which for me, I focus on the team opportunities because yeah. that's like a big deal. And it's a, a, it's something that we encourage up here for our members to attend, to get that team experience. Yep. So, um, yeah, so it's, uh, more that we're pairs and individuals, but we try to put a bit of rigor. And we don't have an over 25 division. So the I'm I'm out there and I, every once in a while I stop and calculate, you know, so okay, I'm three times the age of that rider. <laughs> My um, open pairs partner for the past two years, she was 14 last year, she's 15 this year. So we, we have the big spread. And, um, you know, like I'm three times the age of so-and-so, and oh, I'm the twice the age of that one. So I kind of take some what consolation if I, I don't have a great day that, uh, well, that's why there it is. That's why. <laughs> How many divisions do you guys have? If you don't have O25, do you still have novice and intermediate? Well, here's the thing, Carly, we, over the past, I want to say four years pre COVID, yeah. we, I think we've had a shift in our divisions for each year. And it's largely we, each year we would, um, we do, uh, get feedback from the membership to s look at what best meets the needs. How did people feel about the divisions? Back about four or five years ago, it was pre-COVID, we thought, okay, what we're hearing is that, um, as an example, uh, intermediate is a gate-based division. You may walk, trot, canter um, some of your skills. So that wound up being that a person like me with a, an intermediate type pony was competing against a, you know, a 12 year old child. Yeah. So kind of big uproar at the end, you know, right. you can kind of expect it. Moms and dads don't want their child to have to compete against the old lady. Um, she's not all that bad. <laughs> but it meant that when we took the feedback, we said, okay, how about we shift to age-based divisions? Oh, that was met with quite a bit of positive enthusiasm. We will go and follow finally, after all these years, the divisions laid out by IMGA. Great. We have U12, U15, U18 open, but we better put in there uh, something for the old folks. We'll call it over 25. So the over 25 was not subscribed to at all. That happened to be the year where somebody got a hernia, somebody broke their oh. hip, somebody broke their arms. So, you know, it was just like there weren't that many to begin with, but we were all showing our over 25 age. Well, uh, at the end of that season, it, it turned out that, well, U15, there really was only one pair. So they were always on their own. And so this past year, to make the, the long story quite short, we returned uh, Carly mentioning the different divisions. We return to, we have a lead line. And this year we actually had some um, little people showing up. And it, like, I was down to the Walmart every other week, it seemed, buying new jerseys. This one had to have purple butterflies and this one had to have unicorns because, you know, there's these little girls with their little, little ponies and off they're being led up and down by huffing and puffing moms and, and grandparents. <laughs> So lead line really kind of became a, a, a bigger deal than it had been and novice. And then we intermediate and uh, open. And then we opted out of the age based and went with what we call stirrup up. So defining open, um, the one thing that was in there that we felt that we had a group of people who were not feeling comfortable about 
um, entering into that division, even though there's, you know, a range of abilities and it was vaulting. Mm -hmm. yep. So we, we took that as a, a kind of the dividing line and said, well, we'll have a division. We're calling it stirrup up. Now it wasn't heavily subscribed, but it was interesting to me that there were some people who were a little bit on the fringe. They'd been away for a couple of years and they were quite happy to do this stirrup up thing and have no other ponies careening around the ring, if you will, because we know it does happen a little bit. Um, so we've, we've maintained that. We're doing our feedback survey uh, coming up soon. Our annual general meeting is coming up very soon. So it's kind of, I'm excited to see, you know, what what's the think, thinking is um, and what direction we go next year. So we certainly aren't carving anything in stone. We, we try to think we're responding to the riders, but we don't have that same huge rider base that, uh, you know, MGAA currently has. And it's nice to see that growing. And we have uh, a lot of youngsters coming up. So is your geographical spread like pretty wide? I feel like in the United States, of course, like compared to European countries, we are so spread out, like up and down the north on the East Coast. How, how spread out do you feel like you are? Does that contribute to making it hard to get people to pull together? Yes. Yeah, it really, it, I think it's been fairly defining um, in terms of our ridership being based in South Central Ontario. Um, okay. It's, this is big hunter jumper country. And if you go to the West of us, uh, still within uh, Central Ontario, it becomes quite Western in its focus. But this is hunter jumper territory and eventing. So we're, we're kind of like a, an alternate niche market that mm -hmm. uh, has to kind of work to, to be visible. Yeah. Uh, we had for a time people who were established in Alberta um, and then kind of COVID hit and uh, that just really knocked the wind out of a lot of everybody. People. Yeah. Uh, like when I consider Ontario for us, it's like, to, to go anywhere else is eight, eight hours drive. If I wanted to go to Quebec to compete, we had a person who was in Quebec. So, so to ask her to come here was a big deal. She yeah. was eight hours drive. Um, then we had some, uh, someone who it was in British Columbia. So that was almost impossible. You had to, you had to fly. Yeah. So I think for us, um, as much as I'd like to say that we're very national and based we we are pretty locally based and yeah. um, i think it's a bit yeah like if you look at the mid-atlantic states we're we're not anywhere near as broad as that yeah no it definitely it makes me wonder too how many amazing games ponies are out there because they're usually the fallout of like the hunter jumper ponies that didn't really work <laughs> out and i'm like what kind of market is up there michelle that you've been holding out on us with <laughs> No, you know what's really interesting, Genevieve? We wind up with um, uh, what I call, it's a real dilemma for us um, to get a games pony up here. And uh, it's very difficult. I, I, I was speaking with my veterinarian, veterinarian in terms of, the, it was to do with like the breeding of ponies and horses. How, what is the trend in, in this area? Well, it's been a steep decline and people are, are breeding only Welsh ponies, mm -hmm. typically. I'm generalizing a bit, but it's a Welsh pony that's being bred for the sport pony yep. uh, hunter jumper division. Mm -hmm. And so there's a price tag that goes with that, yeah. associated with it, that is really kind of out of the realm of consideration. Possibility. Yeah. yeah. Our, our, um, because we're a highly populated area, major city being Toronto, the gen, you know, the, that whole region, people are paying a lot of money to board horses. There aren't typically like I I've seen smatterings of places in the States that where there's a kind of a suburban five acre, five acre, five acre, you see, yeah. a, you'll see a horse or two in a paddock. Um, we don't have that too much. We have boarding facilities and then you're out into the countryside. Um, and so it's expensive to keep. If you're choosing to keep a, a 13 two-hand pony or a 16-hand hunter jumper where you might be at a prestigious um, competition with your your coach and all the rest of it, your your money is probably not going to be boarding a 13 two-hand pony. Yeah, right. 
So, so yeah, it's an interesting, and that's just my no, I'm, of yeah, gathering of like my own set of evidence over time. But uh, I think that sums it up not too badly. What's the season um, like for you? So my warm blood ash, actually, I imported from Alberta. And I remember mm-hmm. that they had a massive indoor and during the winter, they'd basically do turnout in the indoor when they had like tons and tons of snow periodically. Um, and so in my head, I started to formulate this idea that in the winter, the only way you operate is if you have an indoor when you have horses. <laughs> is So yeah. what is it like? <laughs> yeah, um, I think this is where, you know, whether you believe in climate change or not, I can tell you here we have experienced generally in the past eight to 10 years, a uh, shift toward freeze thaw, rain, snow, freeze, melt, um, kinds of uh, weather patterns yeah. from about, like, like it doesn't even seem to start till January, but it our winter seems to last longer, well into end of March where we're still frozen. Um, the footing is, is a huge um, impediment to being able to do anything. Last year, it was just ice to make the the voyage between the barn and the indoor arena, even if it was 80 meters away, it had to be pretty blanketed with shaving manure mix Mm -hmm. to to make that a safe journey. Um, So here at home, there wasn't really any riding. I kept a pony indoors and uh, that suited me well. Um, But uh, when we have a really nice year with our snow and our snow base and it stays and the weather as the odd sunshine, there's there's nothing more fun than getting out there until you're frozen. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Alberta is a whole different uh, ball of wax, if you yeah. will, because they have very cold but very dry winters. Oh. So they they always talk about yeah, well it's minus whatever, but it's a dry cold. <laughs> so, <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> well, I think it means you really can't breathe without dehydrating your lungs. <laughs> And so you're, you know, you do have to have an indoor in which to turn out oh, horses. So that, yeah. that that is a real thing. Um, I I sent out to our membership uh, t- two winters ago a really nice article that talked about the rest, the effect of temperature on respiratory um, um, functioning in horses, and that we really weren't giving enough um, credence to even a couple degrees temperature drop as being impactful on their lungs and respiratory system. So it's like, okay, so here's, here's the thing. You actually shouldn't be cantering your horse around when yeah. it's mm-hmm. Fahrenheit would be, I don't know, it was, it was minus 10 Celsius, but I thought, well, this is really good information. I think I read that when you shared it and it, yeah. it all kind oh, of yeah, coincided yeah. with me around the same time that I start. I was running outside. So I had started running through yeah. the winter and yeah. I also am a mild asthmatic. And I remember how traumatic it felt when I was running in the cold and I kind of started yeah. putting two and two together. Like I expect my horse oh, to yeah. compete. Like, am I putting him through this, you know? Yeah. And, and you're giving him it's, no choice. Yeah. And yet, yeah, like you would, I, I, I used to run <laughs> through the winter myself and it was like having that balaclava over your face thinking, okay, I'm taking in less oxygen. I really could do with a deep yeah. breath, but I'll die if I breathe that cold air. <laughs> exactly. and, and having a voice that sounded like someone who ran regularly in the cold. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, it's, it's very difficult on them. And it, it definitely, I think working out just in general and for me running where it is more taxing than maybe just weightlifting really made me a bit more conscious about my horse's fitness and yeah, how yeah, I want to plan, you know, conditioning yeah. for him. So I was curious, like, what do you do for conditioning when you're bringing your horse in from the winter? Oh yeah. It's, um, so a lot of what initially, um, and, and I think it depends on the, the pony too. For for an older horse that's been in shape, they do come back into shape quite quickly compared to you know to me bringing a, a youngster to a level of a kind of hard fitness that mm-hmm. they can maintain. But for Tallulah, we start uh, the beginning of February if I can just walking. If there's, there's no footing, that, then we we just don't do it until there is footing. But um, it's like, uh, uh, I would call it interval training. Just walk for long distance the first day. Then the next day, there's a hydro pole. We're going to trot to the hydro pole. So it all, it all winds up being kind of the same program. And I just base it on how she's feeling, how, what's her breathing like. Uh, so it's when the breathing gets heavy, 
bring it right back down, let the heart rate recover, then pick up the pace again. And it just brings her back quite nicely. She enjoys that though. Yeah. Some, you know, the, the other ones I have, they're, they're better for just doing long trots. Mm-hmm. Yep. Long trots, some uphill, slight uphill. Where I live, it's either all slight up, uphill or slight downhill. And I, I don't know how I wind up with both directions being uphill. I still get back <laughs> home downhill. Anyway, it's, uh, yeah, and, and it's trying to um, maintain your knowledge base. Like, look it up and find yeah. out what, what, do, what are veterinarians, what are uh, equine, um, you know, based uh, veterinary practices and universities recommending for conditioning and and fitting up horses Mm -hmm. um it's 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 a bit different for a games pony when you like i i try to make sure i get the short bursts of speed like that there is that interval training where short bursts of speed and recover yeah and then do long trots then short bursts of speed because it's of no use to have a horse that can do a nice canter for three kilometers if it huffs and puffs when you try to race it to the uh, exactly. high net and back. Yeah. No, definitely more. I think growing up eventing helped me a lot with the idea of conditioning and conditioning yeah. for being able to go take a break. Like you just do show jumping and now you've got to go That's out right. and you've got to do your cross country and your horse has to be yeah. rateable. And so definitely doing those transitions out there and just encouraging like any kids that watch this, it is so important to take your time building up that fitness and that foundation of fitness with your horse, because it saves you from so many injuries down the line. Oh yeah. So much, you know, when you consider that for um, humans going into, you know, race training or, or long distance training, the, the research I read at one point was that allow yourself two years for your tendons and ligaments to get in shape. Wow. Most people don't really make allowance for that because you figure once your muscles are tough and hard, then you're all good to go. But there's a little bit of that you carry in the back of your head when you're working with a horse and particularly as a horse ages, you're Mm -hmm. saying, okay, what additional supports does the horse need? What does my veterinarian say about, you know, the, the, the joints of this horse? Um, Do I have any concerns? Should I be doing things differently? What yeah. about the nutrition to support? So it's it's kind of thing for kids and for adults that are new to horses to to really find a I don't want to call it a support group like you're an idiot you don't know what you're but doing. Kind of, you know, you, to recognize that um, as much as every horse person knows it all, that there are some that you really can uh, turn to who are knowledgeable horse people sure. um, and can provide just that little bit of reassurance to you. Like, no, yeah, don't worry about that. Or, oh yeah, maybe, maybe try this or try that. Yeah. That's someone that's always told me, get three opinions, always get three opinions. Yeah. That's good advice. Yeah. That's good advice. I was going to say as a boarder, I, it's, I've noticed, like, I've always been like, oh, I just want to have my own farm someday. I want to have my own farm. But now that I've boarding somewhere i really trust you know all the other boarders opinions Mm -hmm. because they've had horses you know as long as i've been alive and they've boarded their horses or the owners now of the facility have had horses just you know as long as everybody else and they have so much that i can learn from i'm like hey what do i do when this happens or you know should i call the vet now should i give it some time you just like different things and it's so nice to have people that you can rely on as and it's just a good point to bring up for people that want their own farm. Remember, you have a community and a yeah, because you are it. Yeah, you are it. Yeah. You're the one who has to say, "Oh my goodness, I can't let that trailer freeze into the ground out there. It's January. <laughs> I need to be ready for a veterinary emergency. Yeah, I need to be able to pull that out. I, no. I need to maintain. You know, if there's there's so much that, and there's so much joy that goes with it. I think that rapport that you get with your animals is. Is it like second to none right. when they see you as a caregiver? Right. So it's like a, board, a border, it, it's just a bit different. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's every bit as has every potential for being just as rewarding and, and establishing a trust bond with your, your pony. But um, yeah, plug into a yeah, community. Games, games, I think, because because we're based largely in team competition, you're, you really are building that where if you're doing it right let's say strategically and each horse is being asked to do something they're they're quite good at 
in the roster for each game, you know, a first, a starter, a, a second pony, a third, the fourth. Um, it's, it's a really, um, I think it really deepens that bond. You know, you've, you've faced a challenge and you've got your people with you and you share the disappointments and you share the triumphs and, uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's a really cool piece of it for me. It makes it really worth the drive. Like for when I I come down to a competition, for me, like Pennsylvania to head to uh, Grange Park, there is like, oh yeah, whatever. I I get a tea in Ellicottville, New York. That's the, the only Tim Hortons between my home and Pennsylvania that's on the route that's uh, horse trailer friendly. So that's like four hours into the trip. I get my cup of tea. I'll I'll drive a long way for a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> sure do. <laughs> it's just um, it's it's kind of cool to to have that time, and I think that's where I view it as it's almost it is kind of holiday like. You're you've probably you both would know like the packing up and getting ready, and and getting there is. If nothing else, it's the thing that's going to have you cut your hands, strain your knees, yep. uh, yeah. throw out your lower back. Nothing to do with riding. <laughs> so to be able to, for me to be able to pace that out a little bit and then get there. And then I do allow myself a bit of time to just to chill Decompress. and to, to feel mentally prepared to, to review things about the either the race list or the program or the scheduling. Um, so I really, I try to make sure in all of the commotion that I'm maintaining my, my, uh, appreciation of the fact that it's fun. I I've chosen to do this. I do it competitively, intensely. I, I love all aspects. I love the refereeing. I love being assistant refereeing. I, I love doing coaching. Uh, so all of those things, but in the, at the bottom of it all is I, I love to get on a pony no matter what level of its training and do something with it that it's like, wow, that's better than the last time. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. It's just really, as you both know, it's really gratifying. And um, I figure if I can be at this 23 years and still feel like I'm excited about new things and new team members, ponies they're bringing on or retiring out gently, uh, it's very cool. So what is your favorite race? Oh, it's a good question. It is a good question. I'm, I, I tend to think in, because when I'm training, I also think in categories of races. Mm -hmm. So races that have bins on which you put something, uh, categories of races where you have flags. I think one of my favorites is actually four flag because, um, having the opportunity to play it as a team sport and then uh, here as pair or individual, it's like my pony loves it. And I, I just enjoy the, no matter how much you train, if you've got the caffeine shakes, <laughs> you're going to blow up. <laughs> Even though everything you did at home was oh so smooth and quick. Um, so that's one of my favorite, kind of the more challenging technical ones, where I, I'll, I'll say that I, I have the benefit of a pony that has a, a high rate of acceleration. So I can take time, I feel, to be a little more accurate than, than if I had a steady same pace pony up to it. I, I feel like I can race to it, stop dead, <laughs> do the old lady, put in, pick up, whatever, and then race away from it. Um, but yeah, there are few that I that I don't enjoy. I'm I'm finding with my old age, I can't figure out which eye is my dominant eye. So as much as I can gallop down a field and pick up four rings off the top of those poles for individual sword, my goodness, but I cannot pull that together. <laughs> so yeah, it's just like okay, just know your. Uh, and this I would say to any, particularly adults coming at it. Um, where they're feeling like, oh, I feel like I've got it. But then I got there, I went to my first competition and I dropped everything or I didn't make the handoffs. Just be patient with yourself and recognize that competition is a whole different thing. Yeah. Uh, as soon as you throw a little adrenaline in, it's affecting your, your physical responses and your pony is picking up on it and all the rest of it. But boy, oh boy, it's still, it's fun. Um, one of my favorite moments is, 
is um, when the whole thing is over and then you can, you, you've kind of met your worst fears and then you're, you're driving away. And for me, I have a period of time to drive. Sometimes yeah. like when we were in West Virginia once, it was like 14 hour drive. So I could reflect on all the errors or, or lack thereof, but um, really to, to kind of, you start right away with planning for the next one right. and saying, this is what I'm going to try for. Ah, even though I didn't did it at home and I didn't, I didn't have the guts to do it in the ring. I got to try for it next time. So I think that's what, you know, it's small things that, that uh, keep you motivated. And, uh, and I that's think that's yeah. Yeah. The drive too. I was reflecting on that this year when I was hosting all these little competitions here and I just felt like it was so weird not having that time to decompress and like evaluate uh -huh. how the play mm -hmm. went. And I'd get home in the yeah. evening and it would literally be an hour later and I'm like at home sitting here and I'm just like, Still and the husband's like, oh, let's go get dinner oh, and yeah. talk about something else. And in my head, I'm like, I haven't processed what just happened today. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. We would, when I think back historically and we'd be coming back from there was an like when my kids were younger was eventing and we'd go a couple times a season to compete at the horse park in Kentucky. So you had like a long road trip back to process everybody's whatever they did. And it, likewise with games. And I, I have had uh, a, a really fine traveling companion in Leslie and we can, I mean, we've missed critical turns and off ramps <laughs> on, in on occasion because you're just rehashing things and, uh, generally, you know, kind of living it again and, and dulling, dimming out the parts that were maybe less successful than, than you would have wanted. So yeah, the, the, the drive, um, as you say, Janet, there's such a thing as it being too short, <laughs> too short to, to really process, assimilate what you've been doing. One of the things that, um, for, for us, the, it's the pre-border drive and the post-border drive. Once you get through the border, you go, ah, great. Okay, now we'll go for tea at Elkhopville. Everything is good. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, quite seriously, going back in time, um, immediately following 9-11, uh, the border was a very tough place to try and navigate. And every you had a very strong sense of and sympathy for the level of hyper vigilance mm -hmm. on the part of the, the folks at the border heading into the states. And interestingly, the same thing on the way back, even though we were Canadians returning home. What's been really nice when I think back is the experiences we've had in uh, the last couple of years, just post COVID where the sign of things easing up is a huge inconsistency from one shift to, to another, to one officer, to another, to it's like the here you got to go into secondary inspection, but the last time we didn't, nope. Well, you're going this time um, yeah. to now it's, um, it's, it's quite a smooth um, passageway. Uh, we, you know, of course you have your paperwork in order and it's um, I, I wouldn't want to be without that. But you're you're dealt with at the booth. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go into secondary on the southbound trip. They're saying you're just going for the weekend. Yes, we're going to a pleasure horse competition, and uh, well, enjoy your stay. It's like wow, that shaved so off cool. forty five minutes. Yeah. yeah, and on the way back, I mean, if I had to say, Canada is a little more stringent. Occasionally, you'll get someone who says, yeah, oh, you're just returning with Canadian horses. So, yeah, I went through Thursday in the morning. Oh, okay, carry on. And then other times it's, okay, you know what to do when you head in the building? Yes, yes, I do. Um, so just trying to, and I also, you have to paste the smile on your face for the video <laughs> camera the whole time. <laughs> but no, so seriously speaking, when I reflect on the, the time, because I've been traveling across the border since 1998 with eventing wow. and uh it it's it's a much more pleasant and straightforward trip and I, I think too when you you've done it a number of times you lose that nervous edge that has them starting to probe the question <laughs> now i just spit out the answers no i'm not carrying any weapons or ammunition no definitely no cash over ten thousand. <laughs> Yes, I have one can of beer left from a six pack. <laughs> they, they, uh, I think they take 
that I, I sort of know what I'm doing when I, I go through all that. So I, I don't get into any difficulties, <laughs> but yeah, it's definitely. And what, and uh, so you won something. Oh yeah. I got a $10 <laughs> gift card. No, no, no. <laughs> Twenty dollars. It's a twenty dollar gift card. Oh, oh. <laughs> I spent this many, you know, dollars to go to it, but I'm so happy with my gift card. <laughs> what is your most memorable competition that you've had in games? Like an experience that you had when you look back and you're like, "That was amazing." You know what, Jen? In fairness, I I would have to categorize them because as a team. Mm. Team wise, I I think one of the earliest ones was um, when Border Patrol was in, in its earlier days, and we were in um, I think it was West Virginia. I always forget the name of it. It's Jefferson the one County. The, no, no. So maybe it's Virginia, but it's the one where um, could yeah. It, there's Kings. There's an yep. amusement. Park. Yep, it's oh, Doswell, Virginia. Virginia. Yep. It was really, sorry, stinking hot. And we were a four person team yep. and we, we pulled it off and, you know, I like, we didn't necessarily have the most talented ponies or anything. And that was a really cool moment because, you know, yeah. we went on to, to take confidence from that, I think, and, and had quite a few successes. The other one, uh, so I would shift into the category of uh, individuals. Uh, was when, and I, I totally give credit to two, uh, was the uh, Jefferson County, the, the year that uh, Anita and Mitchell ran the individuals, I think it was mm-hmm. 2016, and uh, taking the over 25 uh, individual championship. And then Tallulah came on to do this a, a couple times at home and did win this year here at home, the individual championship. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's very cool. And um, yeah, so I think it's, when the hard work pays off yeah and, yeah like people will say well remembers for fun I, yeah i kind of equate success with fun sure um yeah. and it's it's tied all in with hard work which yeah. you put in you may might get out if you work at it enough right. well and i find um, it interesting that your most memorable moments are as a four-man individuals mm-hmm. The most yeah. taxing opportunities in games, right? Oh. Where there's no outs. You can't say, well, it's someone else's fault. Like you had to no, show no. up. There it is. It's you have only yourself to thank and yourself to blame. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and that's to me the accountability. And uh, I can remember riding it here at home and little competitions where they'd mix up the teams and you'd have little, uh, you know, so-and-so who was 12 at the time and, and you'd say, Okay, here we go. Who would like to go first? I would, I would. I I do this all the time at home. And then invariably, okay, so that gets messed up. I don't know what happened. Race after race. So (laughs) that's the part where just having three other people you can think you can count on who are going to step up. And in individuals, knowing that whatever you've done to prepare, that's what will show up on the field. Yeah. Individuals and, uh, too is such an interesting test of your pony. And I, a lot of riders, I think that are growing up in MGA right now, probably mm-hmm. have not seen a lot of individual competition because for the most part, True. we're a team format. We don't even do a lot of pairs. We're trying to kind of resurge it. I'd love to bring some yeah. individuals competitions back next year too. It would be really cool. I, it truly is a way of deepening your um, experience, like that perseverance through yeah. a race beyond just your, you go and do one thing and come right. back. The yep. obedience that's that's required out of your pony is, is it really sets your bar. Um, and I mean, it'd be super, I know it's hard for Americans to kind of make their way up here because we don't have huge team competitions, but we are anticipating having um, some individuals and some uh, uh, maybe one or two of those back to back, the pairs with individual. And there's a cool test for people who yeah. are really into it to say, hey, I, I want to test myself a bit. And of course, we're very hospitable up here. We have people that would just love to to host people and ponies and have people camp out on their at their places. But If people are Um, interested in coming up to Canada, who should they reach out to? They watch this and they're like, oh, maybe we want to get a group together. Well, they can reach out to me. I'm I'm currently the chairperson and will be for another year anyway of uh, Equine Mounted Games. But we have a website. We also have a Facebook page and they both go under Equine Mounted Games Canada. 
And we've had numerous people just contact us uh, on our Facebook page. Hey, I want to get involved. What do I need to do? Mm-hmm. I went and worked with um, a lady. She said she came to a, um, a competition where we had pairs and individuals and she came dancing up at on the second day. And I was like panting and gasping because that was individuals. And she said, hi, my name is Joan and I'm 52 years old and I want to do this sport. <laughs> what do I have to do? I said, well, okay, so how about you <laughs> go on Facebook and, and send a message through there. It will get to me. And I respond and I, and, um, uh, we're we're going into as is every organization going into our planning phases for next season mm-hmm. um, now or shortly. Uh, it would be it would be so thrilling for us to feel that our our games family and and I know that I've become kind of a me and a few others go down to MGAA competitions now, but. You know, we're working to get some of our youngsters keen. Um, Well, I know Carly, myself, I've talked to a bunch of the clan. We've talked about getting horse transport and actually just paying somebody to move the horses up there for like a weekend and bring a whole clan of horses up and compete. I I can see the the appeal in that. The other thing that I suppose you would want to consider, it's not that big a deal. Like, well, our um, fear is we have old old trucks. Like, we struggle with getting to PA sometimes. They're like (laughs) like early two thousand vehicles, and they break down half the time to our three hour drive competition. I totally get that. (laughs) Yeah, I've been really blessed with. um, you know, a family situation where I, I just sort of give my dates and say, um, I, I'd like a truck for this and I uh, don't really want to break down on the side of the road. Right. And uh, though I've had a couple of interesting experiences over time, um, oh, no. but, but for the most part, uh, yeah, I get you with the, the 2000 and I drive with a 2002 trailer. That's become yeah. my okie dokie. But you gotta uh, start planning, day. right? Yep. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. I think I've actually planned myself into a new trailer, which I pick up in another Ooh, week. So that's so exciting. Yeah. yeah, it is exciting. I gotta admit, it is exciting. I decided I was too old to freeze and 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 boil and and worry about the bottom of my trailer falling out or something. So <laughs> that's the benefit of having shown some commitment over time to my sport. <laughs> Yeah, I deserve it. <laughs> <Those> battle scars. <laughs> no, but That's we definitely right. want to show a presence. I think oh we gosh, want to yeah. figure out how to get a group of people up yeah. there. I think we all want to experience it for one. I would love to yeah. do pairs individuals, that shift that you guys are talking oh, about. Yeah. yeah. It's exciting. Yeah. It's, yeah. Like, oh man, bring a lot of food to eat. I could not get enough nutrition into me. It was ridiculous. <laughs> anyway, but I would be happy to give tips and pointers and, um, and our, our, our typically those competitions happen in the what we call our holiday from university and school in the late July, August mm-hmm. time of year. So that um, because individuals conditioning for that takes time. I, I, it, yeah. When we have winters off or bad footing, we really need to make sure those ponies aren't gasping and dying. Um, it's yeah. fun for them too. <laughs> kind of important. But, uh, it's uh, it's really nice, um, and I appreciate the time you two are taking to promote um, kind of the whole the whole picture. It's not just about you know what what pony, what size do you get, what breed do you want. Um, it's the whole. Uh, it's a lifestyle it's like a, in a way. A, yeah, yeah, there it is. Yeah, yeah. it's the lifestyle. Um, it's very engaging. Uh, it's a really neat way to meet people, but you don't have to, you, like you're in a context. You, you don't exactly. have to love their politics. You don't yep. have to love their religion. You don't have to, they don't have to love yours. Yep. You're there to meet a challenge right. and that's your common ground. And it's, it's very, very, very uh, rewarding. Right. And, We're so uh, unified over our love for horses, this team yep. sport that is so dynamic and requires athleticism and you're right it kind of flattens the ground it's like I don't care what you believe so yeah. much it, like yeah. none of that matters because we're showing up and we're just going to put you know yeah. our best foot forward with our horse and see as That's a team right. if we can accomplish this yeah yeah and, and there's always like either the next competition or next year like something exactly. there's an opportunity to fix all this <laughs> do better yeah <laughs> 
gosh, that's so true. So we're at the top of an hour. Is there anything that you want to cover that we haven't, that you want to pitch that you haven't? Um, Just that I really, um, I really appreciate the, uh, the fact that there are young women like you and I, and here I lapse into my, I, I, it's nothing against young men, but when I see young women really um, taking leadership roles and and entrepreneurially in in the sense that this is your this little project is really quite unique, um, so I commend you for making that part of what you do, and uh, it all it benefits us all, and uh, I. I I'm proud to be have been asked to to share this with you. and uh, thank you for doing that and uh, I'm looking forward to the winter being over. It hasn't quite begun, but I'm looking forward to being back out seeing you gals out on the field again. Right Absolutely. No, nothing more exciting than when we wrap up a competition. Everyone's giving each other hugs and high fives oh, yeah. and, yeah. you know, yeah. drive safe. And I know yeah. I always go into the winter and I'm like, the worst. Oh, now I just feel down. <laughs> like there's no real competition. Yeah. So I'm hoping this platform is a way if you are feeling sad because you can't ride your horse right now, you could tune into yeah. Unbridled yeah. and you can listen yeah. to stories of people like tune Michelle and us. You got it. Yeah. That beats walking your uh, horse through shower curtains in the barn, I think is what the other thing you're supposed to do. And <laughs> <laughs> you can walk your horse through shower <laughs> well thank you so much for joining us You're we really welcome, appreciate ladies. it and yep. anybody who's watching okay. please like subscribe go to our youtube and subscribe there i've got a ton of followers on facebook now we've got to shift you guys onto youtube youtube is the second largest search engine i found out on the internet and so we need to build our platform and presence there so we can shift onto our podcasting platform so go to youtube like subscribe check out the next episode and thank you so much michelle thank you michelle good. Bye. you're listening to unbridled with your host genevieve and Carly. Welcome to Unbridled.